Hi, it's Greg Hurrell here, and tonight I want to talk about NeoVim. Um, and I'm planning on doing this in two parts. So this first screencast is going to be high-level discussion of NeoVim. Um, and the next one is going to be a hands-on demo, and someone's calling my phone. I should take it, shouldn't I? Could be funny. Hello? We would like to inform you that thanks to the Friends and Family Rewards Program, your membership was drawn to receive a complimentary stay. I'm going to have to take this because it sounds pretty damn important. Thanks for your patience. So now I'm going to talk about Vim and NeoVim at a high level, like I said I would. Um, now, you probably know that NeoVim is a fork of Vim. Uh, it was started a few years ago mostly because it was really hard to get big features accepted into Vim itself. Um, and I watched it carefully, I guess you could say, or cautiously. I wasn't that interested in leaping the fence and starting to use NeoVim, no matter how pretty and interesting the features were, because I use Vim as a tool for work and I need it to be dependable. And I was happy to let others play with the bleeding edge, so to speak. Um, and in the end, that worked out pretty well because NeoVim ended up putting a lot of pressure on Bram, the maintainer of Vim, to help Vim move forward in order to remain competitive. And so uh, if you look at the contribution graphs, you can see that uh, NeoVim has been around for a few years. And this looks like a pretty healthy graph, if you ask me. Um, no sign of decline. If anything, there's a sign of quite recent strength. Um, and a large number of contributors with, you know, three digit numbers of commits each, which I think is a good sign. Uh, if you compare that with the Vim one, um, this is obviously only a partial history of Vim's development. I guess not the entire version control history was imported when this was moved into another version control system. Maybe it wasn't even version control back then. Maybe it was like tarballs or something. Who knows? But this is a very different looking graph and there's a funny little uptick here in late 2016, which corresponds, I think, to Vim 7, or is it Vim 8? Yeah, Vim 8 um, development really getting into high gear uh, due to the pressure from NeoVim. So mainstream Vim got true color, 24-bit support in terminals. It got a bunch of new commands. It got uh, async job support and other things that I've probably forgotten at this point. Um, so that basically made it less necessary to kind of switch to NeoVim in a hurry. Uh, current modern Vim is pretty good. Um, but I think another thing to notice about the uh, health of this project, sure, it's alive, it tends to be a bit bursty, but look, there's a huge bottleneck here, which is that only one person has commit rights, uh, Bram Moulinar. Uh, thankfully, he seems to be pretty motivated of late, and so regular commits are happening, if you look at the commit log. I mean, you see that even though he's kind of like the gatekeeper, most of these are patches that come from other people. Um, and the names always appear in the commit message there. So this is a healthy project. Um, and because I've spent so much time refining my Vim setup and building plugins and things like that, I don't really feel a strong and compelling need to move to NeoVim to get stuff done. Nevertheless, I am curious about NeoVim. And so over the recent days, I've done some experimentation. Uh, and one of the motivating factors here was that I wanted to try this pretty cool completion library called Deoplete, which only works on NeoVim. Uh, NeoVim makes it pretty easy to write extensions or extendable plugins. Um, and you'll see here this like remote plugin directory uh, that NeoVim supports and that obviously Deoplete also does. I can just create this directory in my doc files drop stuff in there and have it work with Deoplete, uh, which happens to have a pretty usable, easy to extend API. Um, and I think the proof that it's so, uh, the proof that it's usable is is, is in the, uh, the fact that there are a bunch of community supplied third party integrations with Deoplete that are pretty high quality. So I wanted to try this thing out. Um, and I think, uh, one of the key things that I needed to do to be able to try it out in a meaningful way was port some custom completion engines that I had made for Ucomplete Me to work with Deoplete. And so you can see here I've got a fork of the Ucomplete Me repo. Um, I need the fork for a couple reasons. One is because it's really hard to get anything at all accepted 
upstream in you completely because the maintainer is very conservative. Um, so historically I've needed to, if I had a bug fix or a little uh, UX thing that I wanted to uh, get in, for example, this one, RFC, add support for accepting and completion, um, couldn't get it in. So basically doomed to have a fork forever. Um, and furthermore, uh, this thing here has a sub-module in it under third party where the real completion engines are. So this is another Git repo that you have to fork if you want to make a change. Um, and then in order to have you complete me reference the fork, you need to fork that even if you don't want my bug fix. So you've got these two forks that you're going to maintain forever. I mean, if we look in the, the YCMD fork uh, that I have, and um, we look at the commits I've made here, um, what I did is add two completion engines. Um, one for mail addresses so that I can use MUT to compose email um, in Vim and have addresses autocomplete, and the other so I can have links autocomplete when I'm writing markdown documents because my website, wiki, blog, etc., are all, all edited using Vim uh, and markdown source. So those are in the fork. Um, and I did ask about whether or not the maintainer had ever considered switching to a plugin based architecture. Um, and apparently the answer is that they did do that and he didn't like it because he felt that he was no longer free to change the internal API of the completion plugins. Um, and furthermore, he wanted to actually incentivize people to push things upstream um, by making it like not extensible. Um, so it's very much kind of a centralized development model there. And the, the, the casualty that he describes is like, I have a useful completer, but no one else would want it. So the only way I can use it is to fork. And he kind of says, well, bad luck. Fair enough, it's his project. Um, and I've been more than happy to maintain these forks and not update them because it's basically solid. I don't need to uh, uh, update this stuff. It still works. So um, I'm now looking at his one instead of mine. Uh, but yeah, basically, uh, you know, you can see I did these like last year and I haven't updated since. The last commit that I built on top of was from 2015. Um, similarly here, if we go to the uh, list of commits, um, so my first thing here was like 2015 and I'm building on 2015 code with a, you know one or two cherry picked things on top of it. It's been fine. So I would like to not have the fork, but having the fork is not the end of the world. Um, and so that brings us back to NeoVim. Um, basically wanted to take it for a drive, uh, install Deoplete and see how much work was required to get my custom completion engines ported over. So I'm gonna talk about that in the next screencast.